Now begins this workshop. Um, it doesn't look like a workshop. It looks like a room full of uh, a smallish audience. And also all of the front rows are uh, empty. A workshop, see these words are, I mean, if I may begin there, it's really useless, these words, like round tables and workshops and conversations and so on. If it's a real workshop, you think somebody tells me, yes, 10 to 4? No, it's until the work is done, you have a workshop. So, and also, the, you know, this is, I'm looking up at an audience, sparsely distributed, nobody in the front rows. This ain't a workshop. But we'll do our best. The, the, um, um, there's, an, um, there's a Bengali word which is actually used uh, all over India and which Dipesh Chakrabarti has used, I believe, in his provincial... Uh, thank you so much, dear. Thank you. In his... Unless you're leaving. You see, she might have been leaving. <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful. Dipesh Chakrabarti has used it in his um, provincializing Europe. And the word is Adda, right? Adda, which is like you know, a kind of free form uh, chat with many focuses and just like many silences and many extremely kind of uh, uh, extremely vocal periods and so on. And is it can take place anywhere, etc. Well, I just got an invitation from Brown University saying that they are starting a series of Addas and each person will speak 15 minutes and the first book to be discussed will be Lila Gandhi's new book. And I thought to myself, man, I've heard everything. I know that I have participated in many addas, and no one tells anybody how long they're going to speak, and the light is not strong. In fact, many people are hiding because they're not supposed to be on this adda, and they're just kind of, you know, sitting here and there. So it's okay. We we take these words from um, a living discourse and pretend that that's what we're doing. Now, another thing that I know, skeptic uh, as I am, I've been told that it's, uh, this, the stimulus for this workshop will be my aesthetic education in an era of globalization. I doubt that mo many, most of you have actually plowed through that book. Now, in my class, see, since a class does, my class certainly does not pretend to be an adda or a workshop or a round table or a conversation or a jolly pizza party or anything. My class is, you know, you come to my class and you're in for a hard time. I give myself a hard time so the students don't mind. I work very hard for them. So the students don't mind. I have self-selected groups. In my class, there is a rule, which is do not begin any question with, I didn't have the time to read the text, but. If you haven't had the time to read the text, but, shut up. <laughs> this is my, this is my, you can listen, I'm not going to turn you out. But there may be people in the class who have read the text. Okay, and I'll tell you, but here, of course, it's perfectly fine. Even if you not only have you not read my book, but you've never read a book in your whole life, you're most welcome here, and I'm your workshop partner. So, first of all that. And secondly, I will say that um, last, two years ago, I gave a, no, are these people leaving because I was too harsh? <laughs> <laughs> you see what happens, eh? <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, uh, in 2012, I gave a series of lectures at University of Pune in, um, in India. <coughs> now, it was four days of six hours each. It was a huge amount of uh, length of time, and, but the students, 160 students had registered, and they had really, I mean, I was teaching Fanon reading Hegel. I was teaching all kinds of very complicated books. And they had really read everything very carefully. They gave little papers. And I, you know, 
a class is good if, you know, the people are really... So it was a, really a fantastic experience for me. And then a woman who read the thing because she had to transcribe it, Lara Choksi, she said this should be a book. So we worked. I had no time for any extra book. So therefore, we would meet wherever we could meet Paris, London. I would be, she lives in Warwick. And we would work from 6.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock on the day that was free of this jaunt. And I would sit with the printout. She would sit with the laptop. I would edit verbally. The book is going to be out in October. It's called Readings. Now that very summer, after finishing the Pune thing, I go to Birkbeck College in Britain, in uh, London University. Boring little money, uh, uh, money uh, thing, money what, money making, uh, money making um, uh, critical theory summer school. I've been at more summer schools than most people have had hot meals. I knew that they hadn't read anything. So I come in the first day. I'm just coming from this other thing. And the, I come in the first day because, you know, if you don't take the teacher seriously, the teacher can't, won't do anything. What? You know, the laborer is worthy of her hire. So I come in and I say the truth. I say, look, I understand you're very busy and uh, you have a lot of reading to do. So I have a feeling that you probably have not been able to finish Mrs. Gaskell's North and South. So uh, let me hear uh, how much you've read. Not a single person had read. So I said, well, I'm very sorry. I'm not going to read the book with you because you're not going to just kind of write down quickly, quickly, Spivak's reading. Spivak is giving us a reading of North and South. No way, I'm not a commodity. So I'm not. Really. So someone is saying, you know, you're really being very hard on us. I said, who's being hard on whom? Think again. I came here ready to share some pleasure with you. Read one of the great gendered texts of the world. And not one of you have respected me enough to read the book. You think I'm being hard on you? You want to complain? Go complain, no problem. But, and I was thinking to myself, the contrast between happily standing for six hours a day for four days, and then out of it coming a thing that someone else said this has to be a book, and it's just finished, like in with the, that editing, and I'm taking it as a present for the 91-year-old Ranajit Guha, the head of the Subaltern Studies Collective. I'll be in Vienna in his apartment for half an hour because I have to give a talk in Linz. But I felt that I wanted, you know, he's also Indian, right? So I wanted, I'm not an identitarian, but this was an Indian student of English speaking to Indian students of English. All kinds of things came out as to what humanities students should really take as a responsibility. And I want to give it to this senior person. And over against that was that kind of complete, uh, complete negligence of the passing uh, person name. And then they will say, they will come up and say, can we take a photograph with you? <laughs> Sorry, keep me in your heart. <laughs> but, you know, see, so this is just a story. Now we can start our workshop. I have, I have no format. But in general, what happens is uh, 10 to 20 minutes, the workshop person <coughs> says something, and then you start questioning. Will that do? Shall I go like that? Or shall I say nothing and say, start questioning? <laughs> what? Which? Questions? OK, so the, I, uh, the, wa my, one of my theories is much better. One of my theories is, is uh, I, it's in that book also, it's called Affirmative Sabotage. Okay, the um, sabotage, as you know, is a French word which means to make a machine useless. On the other hand, it seems to me that uh, the, um, the people who uh, went in for colonialism had a good deal of time and had also these kinds of um, standing um, armies, as it were, <coughs> to develop very complicated tools. And it is not a good, it's not a smart idea to throw those tools away and make them, uh, in, uh, make them useless. 
So what I was saying um, earlier this morning, I, I'll repeat, but now it has a name. It's, um, uh, it's a better idea to learn how to use those tools as well as one can, and then to use them for, uh, <clears throat> for goals for which they were, not, they were not created, so that we can take advantage of the labor of our former masters. So this, is, this concept is affirmative sabotage. And um, so, <coughs> gosh, I've done something to my throat. So to an extent, the title of, the, of my book refers to that kind of a gesture. I am sabotaging affirmatively a very famous um, exchange of letters in which, not exchange, but a series of letters published by the great German <coughs> intellectual poet, dramatist Schiller. His book is Aesthetic Education, right? And so is my book called Aesthetic Education. Now, I gave a, <coughs> I gave a, a thing, you know, um, where did my um, person go? I think it would be a good idea to give me a cup of tea or coffee, because I clearly have done something to my throat. So do you think it's, ah, there you are. Thank you, brother. So coffee is good. Coffee is good, with a little bit of milk. Thanks. Thanks. So um, uh, therefore, the, uh, our, my teacher, Paul Deman, had suggested that Schiller had misread the, remember, I'm a Europeanist, R had misread the great German philosopher Kant. And uh, that is so. Kant b has been called by many people the inaugurator of modernity. In what way? He understood that, it, uh, that the idea that we can truly philosophize make philosophy was in itself not necessarily correct, that human beings can, in fact, philosophize. But we cannot not philosophize. But we should take it into account that the guarantee for this is, can, cannot be proved by us in a court of law. This, is, this was Kant's argument with the British thinker and philosopher Locke that you cannot prove the basis of what you have to assume, space, time, and so on, but you cannot prove them legally. This is what Kant calls transcendental deduction. So there is, at one end, no guarantee. And then the human understanding cannot accede to reason by itself. Therefore, in fact, the, um, the human being makes his, and in Kant's case it's all his, makes his philosophy in terms of the body's sensations. That's all we have. We know that we have to have a, a connected world, like the lights are burning, there are tables, people are sitting, I'm talking, they are listening. We have to have a connected bit of experience out of all the little bits of information that we are getting. So that guarantee of our sensible world and our understanding, on that basis, we make a philosophy. There is no guarantee for this. And therefore, since we are also programmed to say that we are free, and we are also programmed to say that things have a cause. There is a certain kind of uh, reason we have, which is not pure, where these things that according to that pure reason would be mistakes, we are obliged to say, and on this our world is run. And then this, now this thing, what Kant was doing was, Kant was taking what had been thought of as mere fatalism, and he was turning that into a philosophical system. 
But nobody really wanted to understand this because human beings want to think that they're really hunky-dory. So they didn't really want to accept this. Kant was turned into something else, especially because the English translations from the 18th century on down are miserable. They're very psychological. But so therefore, this relentless and implacable kind of uh, idea that we are obliged to, bound to philosophize and almost undermining the possibility of philosophizing itself. This is called critique. The, the, this implacability of the critique, Schiller transformed into what is more comfortable for us, which is a chiasmus, that is to say, a balance. Hmm? So the, it was very nice, and he could say that we can really have, according to these philosophical principles, aesthetic education that will make you moral. I'm not going to go into Kant's notions of aesthetic, et cetera, and why moral is um, uh, there. Uh, many of you know it, and those of you who know, don't know it will read it for yourself. Anyway, so uh, this, wa this was his mistake. He could not, as many people can't, he could not understand Kant's relentless honesty. And the thing is that about uh, the limits of uh, human ignorance or human knowledge and the um, a programmed nature of our need to say that we are free, our need to say that uh, everything has a cause. You, this was a very interesting um, idea, but it's hard to bear. Uh, so the, uh, and so Schiller turned it into this nice, solid, sweet thing. Now, um, this I took, uh, and uh, now Demand had said, therefore, that Schiller had misread Kant. Now, I suggested that everybody, uh, you have to misread things in order to use them. And so therefore, what kind of misreading are you doing? Remember, this relates to affirmative sabotage. Because an affirmative sabotage is basically a misreading. You read things in ways that the text didn't want to be read. So, you know, when Fanon reads Hegel, Fanon has to forget that Hegel had said that black folks were not human. You, their text was not written to be read by a black man, but Fano was reading it, reading it, turning it around, and so and absolutely uh, denying the possibility that uh, one should simply base everything one did when one was in the imperialized high class as if the experience of blackness would tell him everything. This the, Fano was. Uh, very critical of this. And so, therefore, this using something, misusing something, if you like intended mistake, that it, you are not going to, uh, the, you're not going to avoid it. So in the place of Kant's critique, which it is impossible to use, and in the place of Schiller's palliative mistake, of turning that into nothing but the possibility of the play impulse balancing everything, I put in there the double bind. And I suggested that I can use this. All right, number one. Number two, I used the word aesthetic because I wanted to take it away from the very complicated European 18th century theories, which did not do anybody any good because whatever it promised did not happen. And also, it did a good deal of harm to liberally educated upper class people or upper classed people in the colonies. So therefore, I wanted to wrest it back from that tradition. For me, aesthetic simply meant, and if you read the book, it's a long book, I say, I am using this word because a word can be used by anyone, and anyway, Baumgarten and so on, the ones, the 18th century aesthetic theorists did not use it in the Greek sense, which would only have given them uh, sensibilities. So I am using it to mean, it's a formula word, to mean imaginative training for epistemological performance. Imaginative training for epistemological performance. What is 
epistemological imaginative training I'm laying aside because this is an, I'm not going to give a full length lecture but what is epistemological performance epistemological performance is to change the way you know things you construct things to uh, as objects of knowledge how do you create how do you know yourself and your world this is epistemological performance so the idea that uh, Marx says in Capital Volume 1, which was the only book he published, and this was uh, written uh, collectively, he didn't write it alone, but uh, in this book, he wants the worker to stop constructing, hey, 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 don't talk while I'm talking, I get very nervous, I'm intellectually insecure. You wanna talk, then you can talk elsewhere, please. It's very nerve wracking, because I don't even know, talking about Marx and all these European philosophers, what you're thinking, dead white males. And then I see two people smiling and talking, it's unnerving, okay? Think of me as a human being suffering. Anyway, so, uh, so therefore, see, that is also epistemological performance, to think of the teacher as human. But the, um, so when Marx asks the uh, working class, uh, the working class, the worker, to think of himself, or in Marx it was also herself, not as a victim of capitalism, but as the agent of production, this is epistemological performance. In other words, you know yourself differently as object of knowledge. Epistemological performance, very hard, very, very hard. You can say to me you're doing it, but in fact, it's, uh, it's not, you're shifting your desires is not so easy. Ta saying it is easy. What one has to remember is every self-declared rupture is also a repetition. Every self, let other people say it. You declare that you have really changed and epistemologically performed. Look, ma, no hands. You're probably just kind of uh, deluding yourself. Let other people say it. We are open for other people. This is one of the things that uh, is uh, part of my idea of an aesthetic education. Imaginative training for epistemological performance. Another example that I can give you, which I always give, is, um, you know, when in uh, migration, the mother thinks honor and the daughter thinks reproductive rights. That, that is an epistemological performance. They love each other. They are irritated with each other. But what has happened is when the great Hawaiian um, uh, Kamehameha on his own thought to make cannibalism, which was after all a, a philosophical thing, it wasn't just that people ate uh, animal like human flesh, it was taking the energy of the, the vanquished wa warrior into yourself and all of that stuff. When he decided that this was going to be cr a crime, that was an epistemological performance. It wasn't Captain Cook who told him that. On his own, Kamehameha decided. There are people like this who are capable of aesthetic um, education in this sense. Imaginative training or self-training for epistemological performance. My, I have, uh, this example is also I give. Now I'm 72 years old. I've been married three times. I have no husband and I have no children. Most people would consider this a life of uh, barrenness and sorrow. My mother, on the other hand, who refused, in my family uh, marriages are still arranged, who refused when I was 15 to arrange my marriage, saying there's nothing particularly wrong about uh, arranged marriages. Most marriages, in fact, are arranged. But people only look at the bad examples and draw conclusions from it. In fact, marriages made when, and my mother was uh, an educated woman, so she was using a Bengali which was on the level of the English words that I'm going to use, marriages made in the confusion of libidinal uh, directions li uh, are not are mistaken for a choice, are not necessarily the best things. These are social contracts. On the other hand, when marriages are arranged, said my mother to me, uh, the parent knows what will make the child happy. There's a lot of investigation goes on. But dear, and I was only 15, you already have such a life outside 
uh, the, the home, and it was true, I did. And the, I do not know what is going to make you happy. She was a widow, and she was only 43. And a 43-year-old Hindu widow in 1957, this was a hard thing to say. She said, so I cannot arrange your marriage. I will tell you the offers that are coming. I was a big girl. You know, I was in third year of college. It was a good family. And so uh, she, uh, and it's hard to believe now, but even a good-looking girl, so that the, she was, she would, uh, you know, she, but she would tell me, but that's it. Now, I, she gave me freedom. She took the, uh, in other words, once she did this, I had nothing to do in society, right? Because my obligation was to be, a good wife, That's, that was my role. So I was completely free, number one. Number two, she could have uh, thought, I'm going to, uh, uh, Gayatri can blame me for her failed life. Instead of which, she so arranged my imaginative training and my epistemological performance that right or wrong, I think of myself as free rather than anything else. So this is also the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I say aesthetic education. You know, what I was telling my friends here about think of the teacher as a human being, earning her living in the room, suffering, wa wondering whether she's actually getting through to everyone. Can she please a whole crowd whom she doesn't know at all? Then that's also renegotiating the contract between student and teacher, isn't it? So therefore, the, that is my, I say this again and again, my notion of an aesthetic education. Imaginative training for epistemological performance, not the 18th century uh, stuff that I learned in graduate school, and the affirmative sabotage of Schiller's inability to grasp the implacable relentlessness of the inauguration of modernity. <coughs> That's the book. Now, globalization. I had wanted to say globalizability, aesthetic education in an era of globalizability. Some people in the audience, because I don't know where you're coming from, some people in the audience will know that that's uh, Walter Benjamin. It's a very, very famous book by Walter Benjamin about mechanical reproducibility, eh? the work of art. Although in English it's translated mechanical reproduction. Hmm? But I wanted to do this because I really don't mean globalization. I mean to say everything can be globalizable now because of the silicon chip, because of the state of uh, capital, etc. That's what I was saying about your quality enhancement Program. Program is it? No. What is it? Project. project. Quali I knew it was a P. Quality enhancing project because I was saying that it comes out of the so-called rule of law that comes out of the fact that national capitals have been made, um, uh, have been subsumed under a global capital so that the state is now managerial of global capital rather than uh, necessarily focused toward the citizens of the particular state. And this calls forth a kind of governance, neoliberal gov governance, where governance is undertaken by what is called rule of law. This is particularly um, evident in the area of intellectual property. But what that's as it may be. So in that kind of a way, everything is globalizable. And you globalize it, you put it in the circuit of, uh, of the global, uh, capital, on the, much of which is finance capital, many of which is uh, virtual capital, so that it doesn't even ever get realized as anything. But the explanations you offer <coughs> are, not, are not global. And explanations are state-focused, local-focused. This is a very amazing thing, because, you know, when I was in Stellenbosch, there were many nice people, business people, who had been invited, big business people, including uh, the former finance minister, what was it, Trevor Manuel, is that a name? Yes. Okay, all, they, were, they had all been invited. But they were offering, and you know, the a woman who was there was the head of the CEO of the Barclays uh, Africa Group, right? So that's global. So the thing is, but the way they were talking, it was as if 
the, uh, they could just do nice business practices for nice young black people, etc. But that's a joke. It's, it, it was as if we were sitting there in the 19th century Pittsburgh or Manchester where the big Mellons and Carnegies and et cetera, et cetera, were doing good for their workers. That's not the world we live in. So the uh, explanations given are still in another kind of discourse. Whereas what's happening under our noses is, in fact, if we have eyes to see, ears to hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That thing still has some bearing on, and that we, he said, the guy who said this was talking to basically illiterate people, so therefore, he that hath ears to hear. But on the other hand, we can also teach reading, right? So that's the book. That's the book. And in there, I say, right in the beginning, only data and capital globalize. Everything else is damage control. And, but this damage control is called global, so that you have global humanities, and you have global this discipline and that discipline. It is not, in fact, the only good thing that the humanities can do is to refuse that interpolation and, in fact, offer a supplement which will create worlds where the globe ignores them. So that's the, that, it, to an extent, that is also part of the book. And the last thing that I will say, no, uh, two more things. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the end, and all through the book, I say that I believe this. I believe that if, the, uh, if this kind of education, whether it's in departments of humanities, or in the bosom of the family, or out in the bushes, anywhere, if this kind of imaginative training for epistemological performance, changing the world and the self and collectivities as how we know them, objects of knowledge, if this is, this is the only way not to be duped by this idea that information control is knowledge, not to, so not to be duped by the idea that digital idealism creates a multitude, just that tr crowd control and social media is democracy, that the venting and that you one sees normally in blogs where not, there's, not a, there's not an actually prepared audience discussing issues, etc., that's a different thing. To think that this is what the world is, it won't change, it'll just go worse and worse, and the, and the, the the gap between rich and poor will increase, and violence will order, will, disorder will come in the place of order, all of this. And I do believe that the only way to change this around is this kind of slow rearrangement of desires, but this is not going to happen. That is also part of what I say in the book. I must, I'm obliged to write this, but I'm not writing it in the silly, impractical hope that this is going to take place. So there is that there. I had fun writing it that way, because I could say what I really thought without trying to persuade anyone. So that's the uh, next to the last thing. And the last thing that I will say is that you uh, know this uh, thing that has, that has now been, and they take for PR purposes a man with an Arabic accent, which is a disgraceful Arabic accent in English, the Daniel Pearl Music Foundation. Create harmony, the universal language of music. That's bullshit, because what happens with those foundations is foundation logic takes over. Certainly people come in and have nice concerts and everything, but it's all within a circle uh, that already circulates. Nobody who's outside of the circuit of this is turned into one single thought of harmony, number one. And number two, music is not music of the sort that these people will produce, is certainly not a universal language. It's just like all my American colleagues, always by being born American, they become transnational. When they go into some kind of, a, uh, uh, some kind of an international 
uh, conference, they always say that it was transnational, and by that is meant these folks. So to that extent, that's the kind of idea also behind what music is a universal language. You know, I'm, what can I say? I have, um, I go and listen to a lot of world music, a lot of music in New York City. It's a good place. I listen to music in New Delhi where my sister lives, and so on and so forth. I myself got a degree in North Indian vocal classical, okay, a performance degree. Now, to say that these are not developed discourses, but just simply a universal language, is to go back to the kind of theorizing that you find in Rousseau. And I don't, I think that he was a smart guy, but the, his time is over. So to an extent, right at the end of the book, I am looking at the visual stuff. There's some visual stuff there. And in there, I broach the idea of traces, traces, trace. Trace is like elephant shit on the forest floor. You know, so you see that there is uh, elephant shit on the forest floor, and you say, there were elephants here. But on the other hand, there's no reason that you have a guarantee, because you may be wrong about how elephants shit. Or it may have been a decoy put down there by someone who wanted you precisely to think there were elephants here, or whatever. That's a trace, no guarantee. Whereas a sign guarantees meaning within a whole semiotic system. Okay, so the, the visual wants, to, wants to, the trace to become textual. But the trace has certain advantages as well. And especially, so I re read Anish Kapoor and Chitrohan Mujumdar right at the end of my case, my book. They are visual um, artists. And I say that in globalization, we are in an, on an island of languages surrounded by an ocean of traces. And these traces are sound systems by which you know people are making meaning, so you know this is languaging, but you don't know exactly what. Now, in Africa, there is a great advantage to the unsystematized languages that were not given specific names and orthographies and vocabularies. I'm not against um, learning English. I mean, uh, this is a complete, I mean, I'm a teacher of English. I think English is a wonderful, supple global language. It's not a powerful language that destroying languages are not by themselves powerful. I say to my students, my village students, I sit them down and I say, look here, we love our mother tongue. We have a wonderful alphabet which comes from the fifth century BC, structural alphabet, lovely. But we love it, that's our mother. But look on the map, look how, what little space it occupies. And everybody speaks English, why? And then I sit down to them and see, they're so smart, only 26 letters no diacritical marks. And this is how, by turning just these five bloody vowels, they are making so many different kinds of noises. They won, man, because they had this beautiful instrument. And there are these little children, some of them haven't seen trains. I'm not being Eurocentric. I'm acknowledging something, you know? So I, and I'm not saying don't, and remember, we are teaching in Bengali. We are not saying, uh, I'm not saying ignore our mother tongue, but acknowledge, good heavens, look at this. And then also, I tell them little stories, like, you know, they, they, they're now completely taken up. This is affirmative sabotage of the other side, saying yes to the enemy. They, uh, they are, uh, they don't, uh, they had no idea about the world turning around. They're in their books it was written. But, you know, I'll put a, uh, put a, uh, a stick, and then we'll have class, and then we'll see that the sun has moved on a sunny day. And I say, see, the world's like a big clock, right? That's, that's our hour and a half there. So, and I will say, so, and you know, I'll phone my niece in California, say, ah, she can speak Bengali, speak her phone, ah, it's a, is it night or day? And she'll say, now, uh, they kind of know. But I tell them the story of Galileo, I, because they know how religious people make you tell lies, and I say, you see, you didn't know anything, right? You just, just think this is flat, eh? And the guy who thought, the, the, the puruts, that's the word for priests in Bengali, they caught him. They wouldn't let him say, but you know what he said? I went, he said, okay, okay, you have to give in to the priests, don't you? Because they know, yes, you have to. 
you have to give it to the priest. But you know, the priest went home and he goes like that and says, eh, por se move. These little children, they are, I mean, I'm choking up. Is this Eurocentrism? No. This is to give them some sense that you can, although you are poor and nothing and destroyed by us, it can be done. And I tell them about uh, what with the little dish uh, going over the thingy, over the lid going over the steam. And I said, look at here. And some of them haven't seen trains, like I say. So this kind of idea that there are languages in the, and we are in an island of traces. This is the thing that I get from the, from the, um, from the visual stuff. Now, in the visual stuff, however, something is placed which we did not have before. I was, um, where was this? Yes, in, in Paris, uh, three days ago. Somebody is talking about uh, uh, Salma, the woman of whom I was speaking to Naina. Salma uh, speaking a little bit in Tamil because the sound is so beautiful. And I said, you know, this is legitimizing by reversal the idea of the barbarian because that is just sound. So that's not a trace. A trace is there be language. You know, although I don't understand it, like elephant shit, there is language there. But the, uh, the other was what? That the, the word, those words were not meaningful. They're ba 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 therefore barbaros. That's why, right? So therefore, it's positive when, oh, oh, such beautiful sound. You might be talking nonsense and also making many mistakes or cursing, but such beautiful sound. And the other side of it is, it's just noise. So that's not a trace. But what has happened today is, in the global, since it's all simultaneous, and we can touch places by, uh, by clicking uh, the, the thing, we at least have or should have the, uh, the perception that those are traces, traces. And, the, and that's something that you can see in visual culture because the oldest uh, game in visual culture is wanting to grasp. Here comes my savior. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know why he likes me? Because I could tell he was an undergraduate because of the way the postgraduates were talking to him. And he, <laughs> he immediately said that he gives me the prize for intelligence. Anyway, so, the, um, so that's, the, that's the book, all right? Affirmative sabotage, um, um, aesthetic education as imaginative training for uh, epistemological performance um, and um, uh, um, uh, island of languages in a sea of traces, globalizability. I think that's about all that I, I'm recovering from my uh, introduction. If you have read the book, ask me questions, uh, textual and substantive, I'll be happy. If you haven't read the book, you can ask me anything but personal questions. You won't get an answer if you ask me personal questions. I used to always say to my mom whether people left or not. I mean, this is a very sad kind of situation to be in, that the person is, everybody notices whether people are leaving, but people generally are, have more cooth and they don't mention it. But you know, if I'm thinking about it, I will share it with you rather than, <laughs> rather than kind of feel to myself, why did that person leave? Catch a train, or just thought I was talking bogus. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, tell me who you are. Oh, in physics. Okay. Uh, so, so, does anyone remember what definition I gave of the aesthetic education? Does anybody remember at all? Speak up. And epistemological performance is? How you construct yourself as object of knowing, epistemological. How you construct yourself and the world as object of knowing. That's what epistemological is. And by performance is meant 
by performance is meant that you actually have to take a hand in making this change because you and the imagination is uh, the, you how do you train the imagination i don't know actually how you train the imagination in a physics class although the great scientists are quite um, they are sympathetic to this kind of stuff i mean the training of the imagination i have had the good fortune of hanging around some of these people and they seem to be um, uh, comfortable with it. It's not scientific work, of course, and I'm not uh, trying to say anything about the hard sciences, but this is what uh, you need to prepare the people who live in the world because whatever your task, you live in the world. And in order to live in the world, it is necessary in order to vote in order to expect to be protected by the uh, structures of the state. It is necessary to learn how to be an educated, use, let's use that rough and ready word, human. Huh? And that's my argument is that in order to be a generally educated human being, not a specialist in something, because generally speaking, these humanities trainings, literature and philosophy, reading and thinking good and evil, <coughs> these are not the same kind of training as I was saying to some of you when the University of Toronto, this is a very good question you asked because I realized that I hadn't come through, although I was repeating myself again and again as to what this was. The, um, in the, um, at the University of Toronto, where I got my first honorary doctorate, and therefore I'm an alumna. I don't interfere in the business of other universities, but as an alumna, I could do this. I, they were, they were uh, discontinuing the comparative literature department. And as I said to some of you, in the, um, in the end of Ju last Sunday in July, your first Sunday in August, New York Times, education supplement, the guy writes about prospects for the uh, for students and says, I mean real prospects, I'm not talking about the humanities. So the guy was t closing up, the, uh, the uh, vice chancellor was closing up comparative literature at the University of Toronto. So some comparative literature people around the world said, Spivak, write him. And normally I wouldn't write, but I did write saying, I'm an alumna, so I am taking the liberty of writing to you. And I said that these things will never be cash cows. The humanities work, unless it becomes something else like digital humanities, behaves like other disciplines, it, as it has for years legitimizing themselves by scientism of one sort or another. But by themselves operating at their strength, they will never be cash cows. So I told the vice chancellor Think of these as the epistemological and social health care for the entire culture. Because if you stop these slowly, you will have um, uh, what Einstein says, ideology is run by idiots or some such thing, if you stop this particular thing. It's a, this, is, this is why it, th this kind of teaching, as a, it won't happen because there, things are convenient in many other ways now, but it is something that one thinks about in order to be able to use what science brings to us, what uh, uh, capital brings to us, what uh, the silicon chip brings to us, in order to be able to use it in different ways, this training is required. So that's why I talked about aesthetic education, and I will repeat myself just in case, like my brother here, there are others who didn't hear me, I will repeat myself. I have taken the word aesthetic away from the German 18th century tradition, which gives the strongest definition of the aesthetic. I, and they themselves took it away from the Greek sense. I have taken the word aesthetic to mean 
this kind of imaginative training because the aesthetic allows us to learn from the singular and the unverifiable. You cannot, you cannot say this about anything else. Everything else has imagination in it. Certainly good science does, but the uh, history has it. Every, without imagination, uh, you, you're not alive. But the, the one thing in the aesthetic is that it teaches, a very hard thing, teaches how to learn from the singular and the unverifiable, the non-generalizable. So therefore, I use the word aesthetic, and I have said it many times in this book, and I have now said it four or five times in this room, that I, by that I mean the training of the imagination. Imagination being very simply that which can think of something that is not here. It is almost thinking itself. So the, that particular thing is trained to become flexible, just as anybody can walk, anybody can hit you. If I hit you, which I won't, I will be, uh, you know, uh, I will be probably, given that I'm 72 years old and I have a spinal disease, probably in the United States a misdemeanor, not even assault or felony or, felony or anything. But if I were a prize fighter and I hit you, I would be guilty of using a lethal weapon. You understand? So when the imagination is trained, you can hear other people. You can hang in other people's spaces. You can go away from your own self-interest. You can understand democracy not just as liberty, but also equality. So this training of the imagination, in order also to construct the world for knowing, to construct the self for knowing, construct others for knowing differently, this is for better or for worse, because if you ask me what use is it, if you don't know what use is it, I can't answer you. The, this is another uh, problem, because this is built on a certain set of uh, understandings about life in general, which cannot be really reproduced as, I can prove this to you. Remember where I began with Kant's remarks about certain assumptions about which you cannot, you cannot bring a legal proof. And, and without that in, those intuitions, you can neither mourn nor judge. It is impossible to mourn or judge without intuitions that you cannot be because it is just that there be law. I don't know if you're listening to me, but if, uh, it is just that there be law. But law is not justice. So therefore, you can make laws until the cows come home. But laws, why can laws be changed? Because law is not justice. In the same way, it is good that one writes history. But history is not truth. So that history is always a rewriting of history. So therefore, this idea that, you know, which is also the idea of a certain kind of science, that you can have truth established through experimental verification and so on that we learned when we were in school. This idea is not something that we can work with when we are talking about imaginative training. So you either take it, or most people in the world today don't take it. But that's fine too. We'll be dead soon. The world will be gone soon, given what we are doing to the world. But, and there is also an issue of planetarity, which I bring up, but I won't. Now, another question. Yes. Oh. Now, tell me who you are. I'm Keshi Periachi from the University of the Vidvasishrant. Um, I was just wondering, as you were speaking now, how this would relate to awareness and consciousness, and, and how you talked earlier about the, the slow cooking of the soul, and, and sure. how does it all sort of tie together? <laughs> if it does. <laughs> it does, of course it does. Consciousness is good. I mean, to be unconscious is not something that we want to be before our time comes. Consciousness is cool. But 
consciousness raising. Remember, I started, I became a tenure track assistant professor in 1965. And I graduated college at 1959, and I received tenure in 1970. So all through the 60s, I was a good thing, either a graduate student or a non-tenured junior faculty. So major player in the 60s in many different ways. But that idea of consciousness raising, it's a very American idea, which is a substitute for doing your homework, you know, the teach-in, it's a substitute for, it's an abdication of the engagement with institution building. This kind of th stuff, it does not, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. But when it is made into a substitute for a really changed imagination, then it's bad news. Because this consciousness raising, public awareness, it's not a bad thing. But in fact, when push comes to shove, the old sustained structures come out. You know, the, that's, you, you see, see it in the revision of the laws in the Scandinavian countries as the asylum seekers are coming in. Okay, those are very different structures from the ones that had been consciously put in place. So I'm certainly for consciousness raising. A raised consciousness is better than an unraised consciousness, perhaps. But when the raised consciousness voila claims, I've done it, which is quite often the case with benevolent male feminists. And they're so consciousness raised, they hardly move. But the thing is, that's, so that's what I would say. Consciousness raising is a good but limited thing because it also carries with it the danger of believing the problem solved. This other kind of thing that I'm Im imagination that I'm think, talking about is like eating that stuff. You know, aimer, manger l'autre. This is a different thing. You digest it so that you don't, people don't know if it is you speaking or the person you're talking about speaking. That's a, that's a very different kind of ball game from a raised consciousness. A raised consciousness can also be used to blackmail people whose consciousnesses, unfortunately, are not raised as yours. It's okay with children uh, blackmailing parents, but that's about as far as it should go. You know, children have the right. Yes. How can we do for our children what your mother did for you? It's a hard act to, to follow, believe me. If I could, I said to my mother, you see, you'll have to figure out. I said to my mother many times, it's a very serious question, many times. Ma, if you had my parents and you were born when I was born, you would have hit the stratosphere. She was, believe me, the one thing that I know after 50 years of teaching is, you know, like uh, women used to know by going like this on pots as to whether they were true. That one crafts, craftsperson's pride I have, I can tell what, you know, if, the, if that mindset is going to move or not. It's, I'm wrong sometimes. I'm not saying I'm completely infallible, but more or less. So the way mother dealt with all of this, it's, um, it's hard for me to uh, replicate. But I will say this. What I say to the teachers I train, because basically that's what I'm doing, right? I say to them of some, something very simple, but simple things are worth saying, and you know this, so that'll be good to say, oh, that's all it is, that's a good thing. It's not an inappropriate question. See, what one does is one tries uncoercively to rearrange desires. It's not possible to change minds. People say, oh, I'm making a difference. That You already know that there's something wrong here, pride. But re desires already in existence, you can rearrange or try. In order to do this, you really have to know the group with whom you're engaging, and you know with children. Eh? And my, I was my mother's child, she knew me. So what I say, because of course these teachers in the villages where I train them, they are themselves victims of very poor education, and so they also have lost the capacity to teach. 
So for them, I say, look, think a little as to what question your student will be able to answer. And <clears throat> in order to explain something. And then you ask that question. And then it's up to you to devise step by step without telling the student the answer, the actual material that you want to teach. This way the student, because these are students who have never had their, uh, uh, who have never been asked to make their heads work. So those kinds of little formulas, eh, this is very hard for them to do, Th those kinds of little formulas, that's I think what one does in order to um, help with epistemological performance. Mother was someone who had the gift, and so I can quote the person who, he was not a person, but the na collective name is Longinus, the person who wrote on the sublime. Now his, po or their, point of view was that some can in fact hit the sublime. But for those of us who can't, it's good, said he, to imagine we are speaking to the illustrious dead. Then we will perhaps approach the sublime. So in that way, what my mother did, I do not know. But I would say that this little formula, which I just uttered to the teachers who were absolutely incapable of not telling the answer and so on, that try to think of what question your students would be able to answer. I mean, the idea of going from gram to kilogram, it was like you can't even imagine if you've gone to regular schools that this took an hour and a half. And the, what, what, what uh, um, question could they answer? Someone could write perhaps the word kilo. Because they, if they just used K and L, okay, that's good, you've heard the sounds. And then, etc. And then when kilo and gram had both been written after 45 minutes, the answer that they could give easily is what are the first letters. They could give that answer. Hmm? So from that, un okay, write them down on the side. And then moving and moving and moving, how is kg from, they say kg in Bengali, how is kg into kilogram? How is there a gram? This is so hard for them to learn. But in order for them to learn this, it's going to have to be what question can they answer? And I think that's the way I retrace my mother's steps, by moving from the student's strength. See, the, an economist uh, I picked up, May economist on the plane, says something about how the birds in Chernobyl are more uh, uh, stronger than the birds elsewhere because of radiation. And it gives many milligram uh, kind of measures, okay? I'm taking it back to my schools with those areas marked out so that they can, perhaps I can find them answering questions from what they can answer. So I would say, not, it, the question is not inappropriate. I'm not giving you directly what my mother did because I don't know what she did. If I could do that kind of thing, I would be a different kind of person. I'm not as fantastic as she was. But I can say that in order to turn it into a formula, the thing that I always try to move from is what question can the student answer? This too I learned in Kowloon when I wanted to know how the terribly oppressed women there, uh, uh, the work of working women, how they resisted. And the person in the office of the Asia Labor Monitor said, Professor Spivak, your request is different from the request of the others who come down. I would say to you, learn Cantonese because that is the one thing that they will know better than you and you will be able to touch them. So, a long answer, but it was a fantastic question. I think that's the way. Building, knowing the student well enough 
so that you can take the responsibility of rearranging those desires by way of that which they can answer and it will relate to what you're trying to do. Thank you for your question. Okay, let me hear her and then you can come back. Okay, this is fair, isn't it? Let me hear her. Why, were you following up? It was just a response. Okay, well, let her respond. Don't be too long. Just to say that, no, no, it's very short. That creativity and play are often neglected in our society, especially at a young age. And I think that would go a long way. Yes, but I will say this, that the children who come to school in the, in the, um, uh, in, uh, the, on the border of Jharkhand and Birbhum, which is really one of the most so-called backward places, they do not know the line between being in school and creative, being creative and playing. Okay, so since the, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine, Marilena Chawi has written a book, she's a Brazilian, where she has made these kinds of distinctions as to our ideas of the child. And the th this, there are, see my sister was at the National Center for Educational Research and Training in Delhi, she's a wonderful woman. But she also was behind establishing something that is used in the villages in India called Anganwari for their play schools, more or less. And she and I have discussed uh, the, because she obviously has never gone where I uh, go. She has, she's been to all over the place. She was an important person working structurally on secondment to the planning commission, younger sister. Whereas I, of course, work texturally, right? And she has, her support has meant a lot to me. She has said to me again and again that, you know, all of those plans we made, Sarva Siksha um, and, and uh, uh, Anganwari, etc., they don't work because we could not imagine that there were children unlike the children we know. It's because these children do not resemble the children of the urban subproletariat. So people will say, I work in the... Um, poorest areas of some town or other. Marilena writes about that, and I'm very happy that there's another person who actually can say this. So, therefore, I um, uh, you can do, to understand how to what to look at as creative in that situation. When I first went 30 years ago, I was thinking of uh, the idea of creativity, the idea of uh, independent thinking, and so on and so forth. But slowly over the 30 years, I could see that these uh, mind machines had been so, uh, so undone that uh, it, the line between creativity and play in the schoolroom and uh, learning in the schoolroom and the immense horrors of the state's primary school room, these have not yet been established. When the uh, NGOs from local <coughs> NGOs, not foreign, civil society local <coughs> NGOs from Taluk Talikola went to one of these villages to work against dowry, okay? So there was just wonderful singing and dancing, wonderful, wonderful. Pondebuna, Pondebuna, lovely, and so on. And they took a video and they, you, they showed this video many places and it really was something. I saw it before I went to the village, but no one goes for follow-up. Now, the line from performance, which they are, of course, wonderful at, there are no TVs, no nothing, they're their own performers, line between performance and translating that into social activism has not has been effaced in those kinds of places through withholding the right to intellectual labor over thousands of years so they were in fact they could still sing those songs but the, no mistake had no change had happened at all so to to an extent our obligation is to reestablish that line what you're saying is a very good thing and I think one should see what is discouraged where, and you said in our societies. But the moment one thinks of that as a universal rule, that's when I think our own uh, imaginative training begins to, uh, begins to break down. 
This is why I'm so pleased that I teach both at a very prestigious school their own uh, material, English, French, and German. I don't teach South Asia. And at the highest level. And I teach my fellow citizens equal to me arithmetically by one vote uh, in the largest sector of the electorate at home in India. Because uh, I can see that the same generalizations won't travel. So thank you for that, creativity and play. It's very fine and will certainly be good in many places. But these traumatic places, it's, uh, it's not, I mean, other people do it, but that doesn't really have the kind of effect that one would expect it to have in houses where there are a different kind of situation, even violent subproletarian urban houses. They're different from these kinds of places. I'm sorry, I was going to give a short answer, but ask your question and tell me who you are. Um, hello, Professor. Thank, thank you for your presence. I'm uh, Mahesh Farinaidu, and I teach and attempt to learn through anthropology, largely. Um, I'm yeah, yeah. Here, yes. I, I'm really interested in, in um, the idea of your, your, the double bind, especially, I think, in the context of, of many, myself included, academics' um, lives at university, because of the institutional disciplining of, of mind, body, soul, imagination, uh, for me, research productivity does not, is not synonymous with, with knowledge production, or especially not good knowledge production. But that's the tension, that's the, the sort of ambiguous messages we are sent. Go forth, multiply, you know, be productive, and yet give us good original knowledge. To me, they, they don't go together. They, uh, and yet, um, personally, I play the game uh, and try to, to work within that. So how would we operationalize affirmative uh, sabotage, which I'm trying <laughs> in my own small space, and abuse, and all those ideas are, are within institutionalized disciplining, which is ridiculous because we, one feels it on a visceral level, this, this tearing apart. And it's, sometimes it's as bad as transactional sex. One feels like we are prostituting what we should be inherently doing here. Uh, so just so your, some of your thoughts on well, that. I think if, since you brought up transactional sex, most sex is transactional. <laughs> I mean, you know, how would you understand this? Just kind of an expression of my deep love, etc. Occasionally. <laughs> you know, so the, I mean, why is uh, such a gesture an expression of deep love? I mean, the way people write about it, especially in thrillers, I think, what? It's, uh, perhaps I'm speaking as an old woman, but whatever. The, uh, the, I, but the idea, uh, let's go away from transaction sex. But <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. I'm supposed to hold my tongue. No. <laughs> so, the, um, I mean, I was talking about Urvashi Butalia. Uh, I don't know who was sitting with me, but I was saying, uh, you know, she's written a fantastic book on partition. Uh, fantastic. It's called The Other Side of Silence. And there were, of course, war-raped women, and many families didn't take them back. And some, especially who had become pregnant, didn't go back. And one of the women said, you know, because these people are not Andrea Dworkin, they're not theorizing, they're not into gender struggle, they're just speaking what they know, and they're not into the sort of middle class idea, the Victorian idea of, um, of uh, you know, like love and so on. And they, the woman says, you know, and also, after all, marriage is a kind of abduction uh, by one unknown man. So what's the pr problem? So to an extent, in the exogamy, I mean, I've made this argument in Vienna that uh, uh, the Kreisky Forum, I mentioned this because it's printed there, they, they wanted me to talk about diasporas, and they wanted me to talk about love me, love me, I'm an Indian living in the United States. Basically, that's what I was there for, ethnocultural agenda. But uh, I asked them to think about the fact that the tacit uh, diasporic, and the Alexandria Codex, of course, thinks of diaspora in a completely different kind of way from the way it is now claimed. And secondly, the tacit diasporic without any real formation of collectivity is the wife in exogamous marriage. That, that is something that people do not think about. But it's because it's such a silent thing. 
So uh, to go back to how do you do it in, um, in the, you see, it's hard to say because you sign a contract at an institution. You are not there unwillingly. And so when you uh, ha do sign a contract, then I think there is an obligation not to think of that instrument which you have taken by signing a contract as a place where you will find unmediated production of knowledge. No, this is, these universities are institutions. We know that. It is indeed like I, what I said about marriage does not mean that one does not keep to the ca contract. If one willingly has signed a contract in marriage, then one keeps to the contract, which is a much harder thing than kind of just calling extracted loyalty, willingly given love. So, therefore, I would say that within uh, the university, where there is a hierarchy which one wants to climb. There's nobody here who does not want tenure. There's nobody here who does not want a recommendation letter when looking for a job. So that we are actually willingly within a structure which is institutional, which has a history, within which we have a space, and within which we want to advance. So it seems to me that this, uh, the university is not the place where you can exercise that uh, encounter with the production of knowledge as such. And if there is such a thing, if there is such a thing. So I uh, would like to be um, involved at universities with making the structure good enough that it's like sustainable under development. Good enough so that from the, the, the various sides of the exam structure, you know, like when you go like this, stuff escapes outside of your fingers. Humanities, it's easier. Something will be picked up by someone and we will keep working. So the university, I would say, is part of the double bind because we want to be here. I would tell Barbara Harlow when she, you know, some of you know her work. Uh, Barbara Harlow, I knew her when she was a graduate student at Yale and she had to teach Jane Austen. And she said, you know, guys, through all of this marriage, marriage, I can't teach it anymore. And I said, well, Barbara, you don't like the university system, do you? She said, no, Gayatri. And I said, but you want tenure, don't you? She says, yes. I said, well, when marriage is the only institution within which women can flourish, there's nothing wrong with wanting tenure. So the, you, have to, you have to have a good marriage because that's social security, that's tenure. And so you can, sh you can dress it up in many wonderful ways, imaginative training, epistemological performance, you can call it other kinds of things, but nonetheless, there is at the same time this kind of stuff that operates it, you know. The, and so the university, I think we should take very seriously as uh, 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 most of these institutions are sort of medieval European structure, hardly any change. There, there is a little bit of a change there was in the, in the uh, in the debates between shall we keep the German structure or the Oxford, Oxford Cambridge structure in Dial magazine in the United States. But basically even those are old structures. So basically this structure which we work within, we have to work within it. It has, it makes, because you go out of it, then you have this substitute for teaching, which ain't teaching, people who are not capable of teaching beyond their own interests are uh, more or less, uh, more or less um, attitudinizing and getting a certain kind of celebrity. You have to be very hard on this. So because for me, real activism has been outside of the university. 
So I'm not suggesting that you can do nothing outside of the university, but to pretend to teach outside of the university when you really haven't been able to earn the right to be a teacher, I don't mean passing exams, because I think we do too many exams and they're not needed, but nonetheless, it seems to me that we have to work within the university as an instrument which we are using. And the instrument quite often uh, dictates what we do. And as, as far as we know that, that's part of the double bind. We want to escape it, but we cannot escape it. A double bind cannot be solved. We want to be institutional, and yet we don't want to be institutional. Respect that, that, uh, that view. But when you make a decision you have to ignore the double bind. As I said during the, during the video uh, conversation, you have to ignore the double bind. You have to imagine it is a single bind. One of them is right and the other is wrong and you choose. But when you are aware that it, you are in a double bind in the university, competing, winning, and so, uh, recommending, and so on, when you know that, then at least when you decide as if it's a single bind, you don't think you have won in any way. See, that's the, that's the thing that kills. So within the university, these flourishing uh, senses of we've really rebelled and so on and so forth, that's, I think, it doesn't harm anyone, but it doesn't do much good either. I think it, it, uh, it, um, it encourages students not to work hard. So therefore, it's, uh, that's the best answer I can give. I don't think within the university you can, in fact, produce knowledge as such. You can do all of those uh, wonderful things. I mean, as the wonderful things can be done outside of the academy. The academy is too strong a structure. And so I, we are not gonna budget so easily. We can do institutional reform, and we must keep doing it in the understanding that it's going to go wrong. I mean, that's the best that I can say. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for a stimulating talk, uh, which was at several levels very relatable as well. Um, there's much talk nowadays about decolonizing the curriculum, the higher education curriculum, or uh, making it Afrocentric or Afropolitan or Africanized. And uh, I struggle with these terminologies, and I just wanted to ask you uh, how you would respond to these terms. And uh, secondly, uh, what in your view such a curriculum would look like in the South African context? Thank you. I can't uh, really answer uh, in any responsible way because I don't know the kinds of solutions that are offered. And my experience in Africa is limited to, you know, Accra, Ilorin, uh, Kenya, and just a little bit in, inside. This is a huge, enormous continent, and South Africa is itself somewhat separated from subcontinental Africa, so therefore it would be hard for me to just give an opinion. In terms of my own uh, place, I would say that, but it's, the situation is completely different. I am thoroughly against the idea of an Indocentric uh, anything, because the, I, those who can say it are themselves so separated from the ones who would not even understand what is meant by it, that I feel that it's a, it's a kind of luxury of, on the other hand, in India, we have the caste system, we don't have, at the moment, the caste system is like race. But it's not in terms of, it's not like um, the, the, the exterminative racial 
a kind of uh, co co colonialism, it, our recent memory. So therefore, and anyway, in the poorest places in India, like my uh, students, they don't really know anything about colonialism. And because that was some time ago, they've never seen white people. And they, on the other hand, the caste system is so old that that particular, what Brudel would call long durée, persistent structures, they are still in place. They know what we did to them, but the colonialism is just a small uh, event that they don't know anything about. They, uh, they, uh, they um, uh, certainly have Independence Day, but when I asked a, a person who, what is the independence? He says, well, the British, uh, we, we turned the British out. I said, so who are the British? You seen them? I said, no. So I said, what did they do? And the, he says, they didn't let us um, celebrate Independence Day. Okay, this is the, so it's quite understandable. I mean, American students, uh, all well-educated, have forgotten Vietnam. So uh, how do you expect people in these kinds of areas to have any memory of colonialism uh, since 1947 was our independence. So in my country, the idea, it is a very different situation. Indocentrism is upper caste Aryanism. So although they then want to say, yes, the Muslims are also us, and oh yes, the uh, lower castes are also us, it's a very broad definition, etc. I find it's a game the elite plays. And as for ideas of alternative epistemologies, I don't think there is such a thing. Because epistemology, I mean the way in which you know, is certainly different from one thing to the other. But when you construct this in terms of the idea of an epistemology, you are already, in fact, undermining the entire effort. So therefore, I would say that uh, in my own place, I am not, in, I don't think, I think ideas when they are good are thought by all kinds of people because of certain um, kinds of political structures and economic structures, some people are allowed to put it in public. The ideas themselves are, do not come with national stickers. And so I, m I myself would not feel uh, comfortable in, in an India where uh, education had become Indocentric. Because in fact, whatever we say, so-called European education is understood by the very poor who cannot get into these kind of unexamined culturalisms as unmarked education. If it is possible to think of education as unmarked, if one can earn that right, then it's a very different kind of thing from uh, this sort of mark of mark of reactive putting a reactive stamp on education i would it's, uh, and what i was saying to my friend here you know you want to in my country and again i i will say nothing about africa i know nothing it would be very irresponsible but in my country this they, they don't know, you know, I used to walk with, uh, I used to work in another area before I, some of you may have read my writing wrongs, and I, that, that piece is wrong because I used to work with people who had been kept like that. I used to walk miles with them, I was younger, and I would sing with them, okay? And they were singing oral formulaic so they could uh, turn um, turn circles around me, but the men couldn't because the men had lost that, had, having come into contact more with the general Hindu culture of the, of the villages. But at any rate, one day, you know, since they did, they could talk about places, right? They could talk about their, uh, the name of their hamlet, they could uh, talk about, they, they were very old names, they were not contemporary names. So I thought one day, as I'm singing with them, I would give them the Pashtim Bongo Rajo Amar, West Bengal is my state, and Bharat Hanat Deshko, my country is India. And so we are singing very loudly, but I was thinking, my God, if there was someone here, they would think, my goodness, what a change. Change, change. 
They have no sense because nobody has ever invited them into nation think, neither about the Pashtun Mongol changed very quickly into Pashtun Mongol. Okay, it's, it's no nothing. That's the name of the state, West Bengal. But so the, the idea of India as a place is not available to, to them. The idea of, of uh, West Bengal is now available. The idea of the world is a little available because I say to them that Ben is sitting in New York, it's 9 a.m., my office is calling, and I was on the hump on the west, okay, uh, of Africa, so it was only one o'clock, but see, I've come more to the east, you are in the same place, etc. So they have a sense of that, but they don't have a sense of their, uh, of this kind of, uh, state, country, India, center, this, that, it would be really an imposition of, an, of a reactive elite um, culturalism which will make them less negotiable in the general marketplace when the world is run by a globalized, unconstituted rule of law. So I think that there should be a different E e emphasis on what history is taught. I think there should be, um, on the other hand, romanticizing culture is not a good idea. Romanticizing culture is once again insulting culture. The, therefore, to know what is good and what is, I mean, when someone will say to me, you know, but it's our tradition. If I have earned the right to be intimate with them, I will say, sorry, that's a bad part of the tradition. There are good parts and bad parts, like in every tradition. And we mustn't, the, the, there's, it's no excuse that it's part of your tradition. So therefore, the, that's what I would say. I would, uh, in my own country, where I can fight uh, myself, I would say this, is, this does harm to, in the rule of law situation, to the people who are less, less, uh, uh, less advantaged than those who can think culture. And culture alive is its own irreducible counterexample. When it's alive, it changes day to day. So that contemporary culture is not that old uh, stuff that you learn in anthropology, excuse me, and uh, you say, this is my culture. So uh, that's what I would say. The, um, I'm not uh, someone, and in the United States also, I'm very critical of ethnic studies because of uh, the foregone conclusion type nature. I'm not, not I'm fight, I fight the people on the other side, the racists. But the fact that they are bad doesn't make us good. This is a very basic lesson. It's a, it's a, and that's, that's what I say about India and about the United States. But I'd like to be instructed and surprised by whatever you do in Africa. I have nothing to say about it. Okay, I think it may be time to go. Goodbye.